Hello, everybody, and welcome to Truth Be Told. Really appreciate you tuning in. I'm Mike Gunn, and I'm here with a very special guest today, Detective Jay Warner Wallace, who is a cold case detective, an author, and the presenter of the Cold Case Christianity podcast. I'm so excited to have him on here today to talk about the rationality and the reasonability of the Christian faith. Detective Wallace, how's it going today? Doing well. Glad to talk to you. Would you mind telling our viewers just a little bit about yourself, a little bit about the work you do and, and your story as far as it relates to apologetics? Yeah, I just I make a case for Christianity now because for years I was making cases on criminal trials. I, I am a cold case homicide detective in Los Angeles County. And a lot of the way that I assessed evidence is what helped me to become a Christian in the first place because I didn't really have a skill set other than this approach. I mean, I thought everybody kind of took this approach. I was an atheist till I was 35. And when I first encountered the claims of scripture, I just investigated them like statements, uh, like statement analysis. How do I know if someone is telling me the truth in an old case from 35 years ago, if both the witness and the person taking the report are no longer available to me? And that's a lot of my cases. Well, that's very similar to what we're doing here, right? We don't have access to the eyewitnesses anymore. We don't have access to the people who wrote the accounts about the eyewitnesses, yet we can still determine if some things are true. It just depends on how we assess that work, how we assess that evidence. I think you have one of the most incredible uh, frames of mind or perspectives, and it's such a good uh, angle to come at Christianity with that a lot of people don't have in making our faith reasonable, or not even making it, but proving it to be reasonable. And I think Christians all experience doubt. They all experience, mm-hmm. um, you know, difficulty in proving their faith to themselves at certain sure. times or to skeptics. And I think it's good also for skeptics to hear you to say, yeah, Christianity is reasonable. Even if I don't subscribe to it myself, it's re- reasonable and rational to conclude that Christianity has truth claims to it. Well, it was unusual. They think about our, our system, our, our belief system is such that it's not just grounded in proverbial statements from some ancient sage, you know, where you couldn't test those statements. You could you could look at the words, the, the, the wise teaching of the ancients, and you might say, well, it seems like it's still applicable today. You might, you know, but but this is different. This is about a claim that's grounded in a historical event. It really comes down to the resurrection. Did the resurrection occur? Now, that's something that's grounded in time. It's grounded in history. We have to decide, did that actually occur. So it's not just assessing the statements of Jesus to see to see if they still have some applicability or they still seem wise. That would be one kind of project. But this is a different kind of project. This is a project that says, how do we know what occurred in the past historically? This is much like casework. Uh, how do we determine that that crime actually occurred in the past the way we think it might have occurred? And then how do we demonstrate that to a jury? Same kind of thing happens here. We, we want to be able to make a case for this to a world that thinks that every other reasonable proposition can be made evidentially. And if we can't make ours evidentially, then apparently you don't have a reasonable proposition. So we want to be able to show that, yes, it is reasonable in that it does it is rooted. And this is what Jesus talked about all the time. Jesus would make this claim. If you don't believe what I'm telling you, at least believe on the evidence of these miracles, he says in the, in the gospel of John. He defends the, uh, his identity to John the Baptist when he's got questions and sends his people to Jesus in Luke chapter seven. Jesus does miracles in front of John's followers and says, go back and tell John what you just saw. In other words, Jesus was always in the business of providing you with good reason to believe what he was about to say. He comes into town, he heals, then he heralds. Why is it in that order? Because the healing, the miracles uh, authenticated the message. And that was something that was very common for Jesus. I think we as his followers could do something similar. Absolutely. I, I completely agree with you. And it it stands to reason that our faith shouldn't be blind. Sometimes I think within certain Christian circles, you'll get that uh, blind faith or or we should have blind faith. And that's just not true. I think I think it's not even what Jesus wanted us to have. He left us, like you said, a lot of evidence. He gave evidence to the people witnessing him at the time, but he gives us evidence through the scripture as well. And you're a huge defender for the cumulative case, specifically for Christianity. Mm-hmm. And you, right. you often call it death by a thousand paper cuts, which I think is very creative right. and um, slightly morbid, but that's totally okay. I think it does draw the picture very well. So what would you say is the most or are the most important cuts within this thousand paper cut death in the cumulative case for Christianity? And like, could right. you could you walk through some of the most important cuts? You've already mentioned the resurrection specifically. 
Yeah, well, the thing about that, the, the, and I wish I could say I created that or invented that saying, but of course I haven't, but, but it really is captures the idea that you, you're really building a forest of trees. And, and in a forest of trees, really there isn't one or two trees that's more important than the rest. They all have about equal value. And that's one of the things people always say, what's the one thing? that convinced you Christianity was true? Or what are the two things or the three things? Well, there weren't one or two or three things. Mm -hmm. It was the weight. But at some point, the weight of all of it was just too much to deny. Now, what is becomes the final straw for each juror is slightly different. Sure. And when you interview jurors after a trial and say, well, what was the, because I'm always curious to see, what was the thing that for you was the most persuasive. That's what you're really asking me. Um, and you'll find that jurors seldom agree. And it's a lot of times that that last straw that did it for them, that broke the camel's back, is something that's related to their own personal experience or something that they thought, yeah, you know, I've experienced this too, or I, I have an understanding of that. So that was compelling for me. This is why when we're in front of juries, we make sure that we take the time to bury them in little paper cuts because we never know in advance which of these uh, pieces of evidence will be persuasive for a particular juror. I can't assume I know. For me, it was the texture of the uh, statements where what at least got me started. And so I, people always ask, what was the most persuasive? Well, I can now, instead of telling you what I think is the most persuasive paper cut, I can at least share with you the paper cut that got me started. And what got me started, and I was not somebody who owned a Bible or was interested in Christianity, and I was 35 years old and found really no reason to examine this. Um, but a pastor said something about Jesus that I thought was provocative, said that Jesus was the smartest man who ever lived. And I was willing to see what was so darn smart about Jesus. I really was not interested. I mean, I was interested in collecting the wisdom statements of Baha'u'llah. I didn't have to even believe that Baha'u'llah lived in order to find that whoever wrote this wrote something wise. So I was willing to look at, you know, have you ever written a, a book of fiction and there's some line in that book of fiction that you go, wow, that's a great line. I'll remember that. That's actually got a life lesson in it, even though it's fiction. Mm -hmm. Well, I kind of felt the same way about the gospels. It didn't have to be true for me to glean something from them. So I bought the I bought a Bible and it was a cheap one. And I, I started to look at the, the wisdom statements, the red letters. Well, it turned out though, that they were embedded in the gospels. And as I read through the gospels, I realized, wow, these don't match. They match in many ways and overarching ways, but there are lots of places where there seem to be variants in how uh, Mark describes something compared to Matthew or compared to whoever Luke was interviewing. And Luke was interviewing Mark, and sometimes his description is a little bit different. And you're thinking, really, well, well, it turns out there was a texture to the variations that was very similar to the variations I saw in eyewitness accounts where you've got four or five or six people who see a murder. They never agree. And how they disagree is interesting, right? Because it always, always comes down to something about the, the eyewitness and his or her experience, hobbies, interests. Um, sometimes it's about geography, where they are located in their room when the crime occurs. Mm -hmm. But most of the time, they could be standing right next to each other and see something that's nuanced that the other person misses. And sometimes it's because, you know, they, they pin on something they recognize. I've had people recognize clothing and say, I, rec I, I know what kind of shirt he was wearing because I, I own that shirt. And I thought it was odd or funny or how, how ironic this guy's doing a robbery wearing something that I own, right? Mm. Uh, so that kind of thing's helpful. Uh, but the other person who doesn't own that shirt might not remember much about it at all. So it, it just comes down to what are your experiences from which you draw? And I saw the same thing in the Gospels. And I thought, man, if this is a lie, you know, they, they, they could have done a better job of, and most people who are lying, especially on paper, they really are careful about their words to make sure that, 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 that they won't be challenged. And, and there's stuff here that, I mean, how many skeptics will point to these variations as evidence of their, in, of their inaccuracy or of their um, of them being a lie? They will point and say, this demonstrates their fiction. So it seems to me if I'm going to have a couple hundred years to work this out before we get this to be the religion of the empire, I probably would have worked out some of those problems before I canonized this, these books. Or I would have maybe left some out. Or maybe we just have one, like Tatian did, where he took all the Gospels and tried to harmonize them. But, but what was interesting about this was that they were varied, and they did differ. And they differed in a way that provoked me to examine them as eyewitness accounts, because I recognized this level and nature of variation in real eyewitness accounts.
When I say real, I don't mean they're not real. I mean contemporary, real contemporary accounts that I was actually investigating. Right. Yeah, and that's what gives your perspective such uh, flavor in dealing with Christianity in general because so many, like you said, skeptics will point to these uh I don't even want to call them discrepancies, but I guess discrepancies and say, see, sure. a flaw in the Bible, a flaw in the Bible. When really, right. from your experience, you can look at that and say, wow, yeah. that actually proves a lot more accuracy in their account than you could, you know, on first account, think that is actually there. Well, and I'll tell you that if, if you have the advantage if you're working cold cases, if, if the people are still alive and you have two supplemental reports describing interviews that were done in 1980. Mm -hmm. And so I read these supplemental reports and I go, wow, this, this doesn't seem like it's reconcilable. It seems like there's no way I can reconcile these two accounts. Right. Well, if they're both still alive, I can go back and ask them again, over again. I might be able to figure out, oh, here's the problem. Here's how to reconcile them. If I don't have access to those two people, it's a lot harder, right? And I end up having to go in front of a jury and, and have them assess the two accounts that on their face look different. And don't think that a defense attorney is going to make a big deal out of that because, of course, they are. But then, so it's a little more difficult, right? Uh, if you don't have access and you cannot re interview. Um, and so a lot of times, too, when we get a new, a new a fresh homicide, uh, if it's, a, if it's a, a lot of witnesses involved and we've got a six man team, we'll just have um, our partners. Uh, canvas the neighborhood looking for eyewitnesses. And each partner will then be talked to two or three eyewitnesses, take their statement and write a supplemental report. If I am the IO, the investigating officer, the one who's in charge of this mess, well, then I'm going to get all of these reports back from my partners in which I mean, 20 reports, let's say. And as I put them together, I'm like, oh my, what a mess. And so I know I'm going to have to make some phone calls to re-interview the witnesses to try to figure out why these appear to be different. We don't have that luxury. And by the way, I can tell you that the level of variation between eyewitnesses when I, before I make those phone calls is far more dramatic than it is in the Gospels. It's like if you read these reports, you'd say there's just someone's got this guy's probably a liar. Maybe this guy's involved in the crime because there's no way he could have seen this when everybody else says it's like that. And, and you, but you make the phone call and it turns out it's one of those things I talked about. It's one of those things that comes down to personal experience, to interest, to desires, to distractions at the time of the crime, to where you are located in the alley when this thing happened. There's, there's always something that factors in. So I was never put off by the differences in the gospels as a new reader of the gospels. In fact, it was those differences that got me started. Which most people would be put off. So I think it's so good that you're, uh, you know, sharing your experience so that other people can say, okay, there actually might be some validity to this. This guy has more experience than I do in this area, especially because some of these differences are so small, but people will still latch onto them as if they sure. make all the difference in the world. I, I remember uh, there's one in, in Lydia McGrew's book, Hidden in Plain View, that I really enjoyed. And, and she talks about um, how Jesus turns to, I believe it's Philip, when he's feeding the 5,000 or feeding the multitudes. And he says, why would why would this person mention that he turns to Philip and this person not mention at all? Yes. And it said, well, Philip's from the place that they're right at. So Jesus is talking. And it's like some of these small things that you would never pick up on or would pick up on and find to be almost inaccurate. Right. Another tool that you use is touch point corroboration when dealing with a cumulative case. And for me, this almost feels like a cumulative case within a cumulative case, you know, dealing with uh, maybe one aspect of a case. Right. Could you explain right. touch point corroboration to our listeners? So most people understand what it is to corroborate someone's claim, but I don't think many people realize, especially in a digital age where we all have phones with high def cameras attached to them. Right. Mm -hmm. So we have a sense that, it, um, that, if you didn't, if you haven't captured it on video, and of course we can also alter videos, but the point is like video has become the standard of corroboration for so much in a culture like we have today. But that was not the standard when I first began working as a detective because we didn't have access to this kind of technology. And either did, did witnesses or, or victims. <clears throat> so corroboration could be just a small piece of an overall account. So if I said, hey, I always use this example. If uh, I was in a bank and a robbery occurs and I witnessed the, the robber run up to the counter wearing a plaid shirt and jeans and he jumps over the counter, he grabs onto the counter and he jumps over the counter and he points a gun at the people on the other side of the counter and he tells them to give me all the money. Well, how can I corroborate that claim of an eyewitness? Now, granted, if another eyewitness says the same thing, that's helpful. But what if I don't have any other eyewitnesses? 
Uh, how would I corroborate that? Well, I might go over to the counter and lift, try to lift fingerprints off the counter. And if I found that his palm prints were on the counter in exactly the place that the witness said he jumped over the counter and put his palms, uh, that would corroborate the statements of the eyewitness, even though it would tell me nothing about what the eyewitness said that the robber was wearing or what the robber held in his hand, the gun, or what the robber said once he jumped over. So in other words, this piece of evidence that, that, that most jurors would accept as corroboration of the eyewitness statement only gives us a small fraction of what actually occurred, whereas today a video would tell us much more. But we don't have videos back in 1980 when this crime occurred, so I've got to use touch point corroboration and try to help a jury see that this really is enough. If, if the witness is reliable in every other way, this piece that is touch point only one point of many were that need to be confirmed. I don't have to wait to confirm every single one. You couldn't do that in a, in a criminal trial, um, especially before, before video. And I don't need to do that with every single detail of an account. If I, for example, if archeology span will identify where it occurs and there's some feature described by the writer that is also identified in that archeological find, that's good corroborative evidence, right? It's touch point corroboration. And I, that's all we're going to have, especially as events are more ancient. That's all you can hope for. So the question is, do we have realistic expectations of what could confirm, verify, or corroborate an event in antiquity? And we're looking for touchpoint corroboration to do that. So with the Testament of the Apostles, they have claimed something about what they witnessed. Can we go over a little bit of maybe some touch points that we would look at in the gospel accounts to see what have the apostles claimed and how can we uh, know that sure. we can have these touch point corroborations well, within the gospel? So there's a, right. So it's, it's hard, when I talk about corroborative evidence, there's a couple ways you can do this. There's external corroborative evidence, which archaeology would be the case. There are several, for example, in the book of Acts, Luke mentions a number of of either um, ruling classes, uh, titles of local uh, magistrates, uh, names. Uh, even for a number of years, we didn't have great confirmation of the person of Pontius Pilate. Mm -hmm. So there were a lot of folks who doubted the historical reliability of the book of Acts because the only place where some of these titles, names, and locations were described was in the book of Acts. So why should we con consider those to be reliable? But of course, the more we find in, in archaeology, the more uh, Politarchs, um, Pontius Pilate, um, different regions, different claims that Luke made actually end up being true as demonstrated by archaeology. Also, if our study of history is accurate for other non-Christian um, claims, like uh, certain structures within the Roman Empire, how certain um, um, things occurred, what certain protocols were within the Roman Empire, well, it turns out that Luke actually accurately describes those. As we might know from a non-Christian source, he accurately describes some of the protocols and procedures that were taken within the Roman Empire, even to travel. Even for someone like Paul to get to Rome, there were certain stages in this, certain types of leaders that had to be addressed, certain figures that he had to address. Um, Paul seems to get those, uh, Luke seems to get those right. As a matter of fact, the gospel writers do a good job of even identifying the proper names of men and women in the region in the first century, which might sound like it's not not much. If, if I know with a name that was used in 1950 that was popular in Southern California, there's probably a good chance that I am familiar with 1950 in Southern California. But if these same names come up over and over and over again, and no one is, nobody else is identifying those names in the in 2021 in this region of the world, you would be suspicious that maybe I'm importing some untruth. And here's why I say that: it turns out that the popular names for men, Jewish men, and Jewish women, and just as near as Egypt, was different than it was in the area around Jerusalem in the first century. So that those authors who are writing from a non-biblical perspective, when they mention the proper names of men and women in the first century around the region of Jerusalem, they happen to use the same names that the gospel authors use, whereas the, the most popular names in Egypt are entirely different. And so you see this kind of touch point corroboration, the proper use of names, Ge geography. If you look at the non-canonical gospels, for example, many of which were written out of the region, they do not mention in major cities. They mention Jerusalem, but they are not able to mention all the little towns and villages that are mentioned in the New Testament as Jesus is traveling in one direction or another. 
It turns out the people who do mention those towns, those obscure towns, are the writers who write the, not the, the canonical gospels, the people who were actually writing in the region at the time and knew what cities were in place. If you're in Egypt writing this narrative, well, you, th those non-canonicals, for the most part, do not mention the small towns and villages that are mentioned in the New Testament uh, uh, canonical gospels because they aren't familiar with those cities. So I think there are some good reasons to believe that whoever is writing this, well, let's put it this way. As a thought experiment, if you just took out the miracles and all Jesus is, is an ancient sage who shows up on the scene and he preaches love, he does a Sermon on the Mount, Beatitudes, but never worked a miracle, was never born of a virgin, never rose from the grave, never walked on water. He's just a guy and he drops dead at some point. And he's buried and that's it. Do you think that given the manuscript evidence we have, anyone would doubt the historicity and, and existence of Jesus of Nazareth? I don't think so. I think he is, he is so firmly established in manuscript evidence and his impact on history and all that that nobody would doubt that he existed or question the reliability of the accounts, given how many we have, how early they occur, how often they're copied, all of that. But add in the miracles now. Oh, no, no, no everything, flips. everything flips. And what this exposes is not that, that people are, are skeptical on the basis, the reasonable basis of manuscript evidence. They are skeptical based on their presuppositional bias against the miraculous. As long as Jesus is not miraculous, those are good to go. The minute there's something miraculous in there, they cannot be true. And that extreme for me demonstrated that really that's the, so, so the question becomes, is it reasonable for us to believe in something extra natural that's reported in an account? And I, I actually think that there's good reason to believe in the extra natural just from the sciences, because we all seem to, well, the standard cosmological model is that all space, time, and matter came into existence from nothing came into existence from a cause that's outside of space, time, or matter. So at least there's one extra natural event that we can infer from scientific evidence. If that event is caused not by an impersonal force, but by a personal being, then why would we reject as reasonable or as unreasonable, rather, any extra natural event in the New Testament? Look, if there is a God, the most dramatic uh, miracle that ever was worked is in Genesis 1. It's not on the pages of the New Testament. Those are all small potato miracles compared to all space, time, and matter from nothing. And that's the claim of science, not the claim. And remember, if, if there's a beginning to something, it must have a beginner. And unless you're going to say there's an infinite regress problem of beginnings and beginners, there's got to be something at the beginning that is itself timeless and uncaused that can be then become the foundational cause for everything else. The more we think about this, the more we are looking for a cause of the universe that sounds a lot like the God of the Old Testament, the God of Genesis. And then the question becomes, well, then why would we reject other extra natural accounts? That that is amazing. I, I do a lot of study into miracle. I actually have a video with Thomas Fretwell, an apologist and theologian from England. We go over um, study of miracles, but I have right. never heard anybody point to someone or, or point to someone that believes in uh, the universe coming from nothing. And you can say right there, that is an extra natural event. Right. And that starts to broach into the topic of motive. You know, what is your motive for disbelieving? Or what is your motive for believing? Because believers have to answer that as well. Are, are they just kind of wishfully thinking or have they actually researched this? Which I think uh, ties back into having a rational, reasonable understanding that, that our faith is true. You know, it, it's not just on a whim and we have good reason to believe what we do. With motive, though, uh, you talk a lot about with the apostles' testimony in the gospel accounts as well as in yeah. Acts with, well, I guess Luke's not an apostle, but in Acts as well, that they would have no motive to corroborate something uh, together or to collude with each other. They would have no motive. And you go over three motives in a, in a lot of your work for misbehavior or for why they why they would have lied. Would you talk about that with us for a little while? Yeah, there are three. There's two. It, 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 you could almost argue that everything could be lumped into one motive, but to make it easier to understand, I mean, it's always money, sex, power. 
Those are the three things that get people in trouble. And you'll often see this happens for Christians too. Public Christians who have fallen in the last year, if you yeah. trace it back, it'll be in one of those three areas. Absolutely. Now, the more nuanced umbrella um, category is the power category because it really encompasses everything else that you might not see, obviously, even though there's no money involved. And there's no, like this guy goes in, the, uh, we just saw it yesterday mm -hmm. where somebody walked in and shot a bunch of, a bunch of people in a business. Um, I think an officer also died in that business. Um, I don't know if, I mean, it was Denver. I forget where it was, where it occurred, but this happens all the time. You, well, what, what's driving that? He didn't steal any money from the place and it wasn't sexually driven. What, what's driving that? Well, when I shoot people who I don't think matter, uh, they're a different skin color than me, or they're a different status in our culture than me. That's about me thinking more of me than I think of you. That's a power issue. Authority, power, respect is all in the third category. So when you think that your race-driven crimes are often power-driven crimes, when someone's disrespected and pulls a gun out and shoots somebody, that's in the power category. When somebody is an addict and thinks that his or her personal high is more important than the safety or, or the lives of others, uh, that's a power issue. I'm more important than you are. And so these are the things that cause people to, to tell lies. I just it, look at, but I'm looking at somebody and they lack motive. It does not mean they're not, they could still be lying because maybe there's a fourth category, which I never include, which is crazy mm -hmm. because it's so rare. And lying, by the way, is one of the misbehaviors that is driven by those three things. And there are people, look, belief can be motivated. This is why for me, I was never impressed with the heaven and hell thing. Uh, I'll just tell you, I'm not. Even now, I'll tell you, this sounds crazy for a Christian to say that, but what I mean is, as a non-believer, I didn't fear hell. Mm -hmm. My whole, I didn't fear death. Look, you live your best life you can live, and then you go back in the dirt. I mean, everyone goes back in the dirt. Right. I, I'm okay with that. I, I don't have to. I mean, the promise of this reward of heaven was not tempting for me. Mm -hmm. Okay, as a non-believer. Now, once you understand that there's a God and you trust what Jesus says about God because you demonstrated that the resurrection actually occurred, well, then you start to listen to what he says about heaven and hell. Now, that becomes sobering. But I'm talking about like before I became a Christian, uh, this, these things did not matter to me. They would mm -hmm. not drive me toward belief, a hope of a reward or fear of a punishment. Mm -hmm. The question really becomes, why would somebody write about all this and then tell this lie? Really, the lie about the resurrection, that's what it comes down to. Right. The resurrection is the, the, the linchpin on all of this. And if you're lying about that, why are you lying? Remember, the fact that you have a motive to lie does not mean you are a liar. But if you are lying, you probably have a motive. So I just want to go back and look and say, are they motivated by money? The disciples were not motivated by money. There's no evidence from any manuscript uh, that, that these folks got rich based on their claims or they got a bunch of girlfriends. Based yeah, if on anything, the opposite, they yeah, had the opposite, right? not terribly great things happen to them. Yeah. So then the question becomes, well, maybe they're just because they have, they have prominence within a people group. You know, this is what Bart Ehrman, I think, would say about Paul, mm -hmm. that he became somebody important, which doesn't make a lot of sense to me because he was already somebody important and all this did was cost him everything. I think if he'd have stayed where he was as a leader of the Jews, he could have been risen in that status, have been somebody of importance in that status, have killed a bunch of Christians, and never would have risked being killed himself for his activity. All this did was he jumped in with a smaller group that was always under persecution in the first three centuries and ultimately ended up executed in Rome for it. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I think you just you have, have a hard time finding that culprit behind the death of any of the disciples. Yeah, and even if you add the fourth category of socially abnormal behavior or, or craziness, the fact that it is such a rare occurrence and you have nearly all of the church leaders within Christianity yes. having to, you know, fall under that category if you want to say they did. That's right. The texts of the New Testament are often very highly thought of, even among skeptics, as being uh, accurate to the time period, accurate to the right. people of the time. You have uh, Paul claiming that not only the apostles, not only the, those very close to Jesus, but also many of his followers witnessed the resurrection. So you have right. to not only include 12 men, but also all of the people that Jesus appeared to uh, after his death and say all of them fall into that category of socially abnormal or crazy if they don't fall under greed, lust, power. And yeah, I think part of it too, is that we don't realize the impact that Jesus has had. So how do we know? I mean, how, 
how could someone like Jesus have the kind of impact he had not only on the eyewitnesses, but then on every generation that followed the eyewitnesses? That we're not, there's no other group that has as many science fathers as Christianity. The entire scientific revolution of the 16th and 17th century uh, is dominated by Christians. And Christians continue to dominate the the Nobel Prize winners in science, it's like 60, over 60% of, of them have been Christian. Um, the next largest group is Jewish, and then it's a huge drop down to other religious groups, and about 10% have been either agnostic or atheist. There's a sense in which we all believe that if it was not for atheists and agnostics working in the sciences, we wouldn't have anything. Like we are, it's, we are, uh, we've progressed as far as we have in spite of Christians who have tried to hold us back, but nothing could be further from the truth. We've lost a sense of the impact that Jesus has had on the world. And I think if nothing else, we would be asking ourselves, how could that be? If, if we hadn't buried, like it's very hard, for example, to see the impact of Christ followers online when you Google certain topics, right. because it's all been scrubbed of the Christian history. But if you really knew the impact that Jesus had on the arts, on literature, on music, education, science, and even every other religion in the world, you'd have to ask yourself, how could that be? How, how could Jesus have that kind of impact? Of course, if Jesus is God just stepping into his creation, that's the kind of impact I would expect. So there's a lots of ways to make the case. Um, and so one of them, you know, in cold case Christianity, I'm just trying to make it from the actual manuscripts. But in this next book I have coming out called Person of Interest, I'm trying to make it from everything else. Because it turns out you don't need the manuscripts to know that Jesus existed. You don't need the manuscripts to know that Jesus was God. Right. The Psalms themselves say, the heavens God's glory do declare. That's right. And you can see that very evidently. Yep. And then I like that you brought up that that science has been so influenced because it doesn't seem, it almost feels like science and Christianity are... Uh, warring, which is, I think, a false narrative. It, it's absolutely not true. Maybe in more modern times, uh, scientists fall more and more away from uh, being believers in Christianity, but uh, historically, that has not been the case. I, I like the story of, um, there's, I forget who told it first, but essentially it's that a bunch of scientists are climbing a mountain of discovery yeah. and they spend years and years and effort and they try and get to the top and they work hard. And finally, once they crest that final ridge, they see a group of theologians sitting there at the top and they say, what took you so long? And yeah, exactly. Father of modern chemistry. Oh, that's a Christian father of modern astronomy. Oh, that's a Christian father of co-father of, of, of quantum mechanics. Oh, that's a Christian. If I lost the entire new Testament manuscript, but I was able to read the personal journals and writings of the science fathers who started these disciplines from antiquity all the way to today, what would they say about Jesus? And it turns out you can reconstruct the story of Jesus in its most robust form, not from the church fathers, but from the science fathers. So you'd have to destroy the entire history of science to erase Jesus, because it turns out that some of the best data you can get about Jesus the church fathers agree with the science fathers and vice versa. And all of this to say that there are intelligent minds that believe this. So if, if you're a Christian right. listening and, and you think, ah, well, that that didn't really do it for me. That that didn't really strengthen my faith at all. Or if you're a skeptic thinking, well, why is that point important? It's not about any of these individual points being important. It's about, again, the cumulative case that intelligent people— right. Uh, believe and subscribe to the, the doctrines of Christianity, or the apostles had no motive to be lying. Like these are all small things maybe, but as a cumulative case, it becomes just overwhelming and it, it will overwhelm you if you, if you take the time to study into it. That's right. What would you then say, just as a few uh, wrap-up questions here, I, I really want to reach out to skeptics that are genuinely interested in mm -hmm. understanding uh, the rationality of our belief, the rationality of our, our faith, what one message would you send to those people? Obviously, you send messages mm -hmm. to these people in your work all the time, which I encourage everybody right. to check out. But then also on the flip side, what advice would you give to Christians who have a natural doubt in things or struggle with doubt in a world that increasingly makes Christianity out to be some kind of fairy tale? We've kind of gone over it, but what, what messages would you give those two sets of people? So the first thing I would say is, are we being uh, skeptical about our skepticism? 
on both sides of this? Are, can we find a reasonable middle again? Is, it, is this a safe place for us to explore ideas or is it really a place where we already have to have our mind made up and we really need to obliterate the other side? It kind of feels that way, right? Yeah. It feels like if I make a case for something, I'm either going to be cheered by one side or I'm the nail that's being hammered by the other. Right. But what I don't find so much anymore is, hey, yeah, I'm searching. And I'm, I, I mean, I'd love to get those kinds of, but you don't see a lot of that. But maybe it's just that we're quiet, right? Because we're afraid to even suggest to somebody that we might be considering another view. Yeah. So I think this is going to become more difficult. And so what I would say to you is if you are skeptical, are you able to be brave enough to be skeptical of your skepticism? Are you brave enough to, to step away from your tribe where in the past they might have said, well, he's no longer with us anymore, but they still would like you. They still have dinner with you. Well, now if you step away from the tribe, you're likely to get killed. So, so I mean, you know, it's on social media and figuratively right. speaking. So you want to make sure that you're brave enough to do that. And for those who have skepticism on, on this side as well, I get it. There's a reason why, look, don't forget, John the Baptist was skeptical, right? And not, he had some doubts. He must have because his followers were sent to Jesus as, as he was suffering. So John the Baptist is in jail. I get it. He's not having a great experience. And he sends his believers to Jesus. And they say, Jesus, John wants to know, are you the one? How could John doubt if Jesus was the one? John's the one who baptized Jesus, who sent all of his followers to Jesus. So it's really, I think, reasonable that you would at times, given your life situation, to kind of question if the worldview you've held for so many years has the answers that you thought it had. Mm -hmm. What I see so often are people who leave Christianity because they've never really sought the answers. And then something happens to shake you and you find yourself not able to um, answer the questions. So that's why it's important now, before you're shaken by an event to know if this is true. Well, Mr. Wallace, I really appreciate you joining us today. It has been an absolute blast. We've gotten into things I, I never thought we would, and I'm thrilled about it. I, I absolutely love when uh, two people can just sit down and have a conversation because this is uh, this is my faith. You know, This is everything to me, and it's everything to you. And I think uh, conversation can just uh, really spurn each other on, you know, to, to study more and deeper and, and relight that fire within us. So I appreciate you coming on. Would you mind, uh, would you mind telling our listeners where they can find your content? Because I've found you sure. so beneficial to me and I'd love uh, for people to check out your stuff as well. Sure. We, we just, uh, re redesigned our website at coldcasechristianity.com. So you can join us there. We send out daily trainings five days a week that'll help you to kind of know whether this is true and why it's true. Also for students, from eight to 13 years of age. We've got a kids academy at casemakersacademy.com. That's just designed for like eight to 12-ish. And thank you all so much for listening. I really do appreciate your support. If you're a skeptic listening in, I just wanna say thank you for listening because uh, Christianity, as you'll see, is reasonable and rational, even if you don't subscribe to it yourself. So I hope that you'll look deeper into some of the things we've spoken about today. And if you're a Christian experiencing doubt, please know that it's okay and that there are answers. Even if you don't personally have them, there are answers out there. So keep digging, keep searching, and I promise you'll find them. Thank you all so much again. Until next time, please continue to read your Bibles, continue to think critically about them, and keep strong in the faith. Thanks, everyone.